The Scientist by Talking Soup. Chapter 6 You're Blue Now. Gaster and Dr. Beatus monitored Sands to the point of annoyance over the following week. The skeleton was back on his feet the next day with only some lingering aches and pains, but neither of the other two were taking any chances. After the experiment had gone so… unpleasantly, Gaster was not willing to let anything catch him off guard again. No more surprises. One or both of them checked on Sands periodically throughout the workdays, and both of them followed him home at night. Gaster had to practically order Sands not to come in for late night shifts. He swiftly got used to a constant stream of, seriously, I'm fine, from the exasperated skeleton. Indeed, Sands was showing no signs of side effects at all, but Gaster knew such things weren't always obvious. The side effects from the determination certainly weren't. Eventually, Sands broke down and told both of them that if they were going to follow him all the way home every dang night, they may as well come in for dinner. For the last few days of the week, the three of them ate takeout in Sands' living room. It was rather nice to have some downtime for once, Gaster thought. This was his first time seeing where Sands actually lived as well. He and his brother shared a small, cozy apartment in New Home. This was also the first time that Gaster had actually met Sans' brother. Papyrus was… unexpected. From the way Sans talked about him, Gaster had expected someone quite a bit younger. But Papyrus was only a few years younger than Sans. The two of them were a study in opposites. He looked nothing like Sans, apart from also being a skeleton. He was hyperactive where Sans was virtually sedentary. He was loud where Sands was quiet. While Sands had a brilliant mind, Papyrus seemed quite a bit less than sharp. At least he was friendly. The brothers had that in common. He is quite the character, Gaster said one night after Papyrus had vanished into his own room. Papyrus tended to make himself scarce when any of them said a word that even sounded remotely scientific. Yeah. Sans said, beaming. Isn't he cool? That was one word for it, Gaster supposed. He sure is into the idea of joining the Royal Guard, huh? Dr. Beatus said with a chuckle. Papyrus had said as much at least forty times thus far. My daughter is really enamored with the Guard, too, though, uh, for different reasons. It's all he's ever wanted to do with his life. Sands polished off his takeout burger and dusted off his hands. Then he snapped his fingers. The leftover tray lifted gently into the air, surrounded by pale blue light. It sailed effortlessly into the nearest wastebasket. Gaster watched the whole process and kept an eye on Sands, taking mental notes. The magic seemed to come to him effortlessly now. No stress, no faltering. He's always going to be better with his bullets and magic than me, though, no matter how much I practice this stuff. Sans grinned. You should see him. He comes up with these complex patterns, all on his own. He loves patterns and puzzles and such. One time I told him he should go to work in the core. He'd love all that puzzle building, right? But nope, he wouldn't even hear of it. It's always been the royal guard for him. Yeah, he's always had way more direction than me. Always knew exactly what he wanted. <laughs> he's so mad that he has to wait four more years to even be considered for the guard. Patience isn't really his thing. Gaster wondered if he and his brother cared about each other as much as Sans and Papyrus clearly did. He couldn't remember. It had been so long, and Gaster rarely thought about his family. He frowned vaguely as he realized he couldn't remember what his brother had even looked like. Strange. Are you worried? Being in the Royal Guard can be b pretty dangerous, especially with humans coming through every few years. Sans shrugged. Paps can handle himself. He's strong. Actually, he's obsessed with catching a human. He's always out in Waterfall making practice traps. Well, that, and I think he just really likes those echo flowers. Sans? Gaster said. 
Was your desire to be able to protect your brother the entire reason why you agreed to the experiment? Sans froze. Dr. Beatus dropped his fork. Gaster blinked at them. He didn't think he'd said anything particularly startling. Sans turned to look toward Papyrus' bedroom door. It was still closed. It... I... that wasn't the whole reason. Sans rubbed the back of his skull and chuckled a little, trying to play it off. It wasn't just... it was for the sake of science, too, to see if it could be done, right? Gaster searched him, looking for any trace that it was a lie. Family was, of course, important, and perhaps it was noble of Sans to risk his health and safety for a loved one. But Gaster had been feeling different these last few months. Reckless. If he was going to be reckless, then he needed Sans to be the one to keep a level head and a scientific mind. Dr. Beatus couldn't fulfill either of these roles. The lizard monster was brilliant in his own way, but he was always the voice of reason and restraint. The three of them kept each other in check. The dynamic worked. But not if Sans had a separate, external reason for which he was willing to risk his life. I apologize. That was a personal question. It just concerns me a little. The idea that you would put yourself at risk for such a personal reason. Sans turned to Gaster with a very strange expression. Gaster tilted his head. What is that look for? Sans opened his mouth as if he was about to say something. Then he glanced to the side and thought against it. He shrugged again. Nah, I guess I understand the concern. I get it. You want to know I can stay focused on our work and that I'm not gonna, I don't know, steal the human souls and give them to Papyrus or something. That certainly hasn't even crossed my mind. Sans waved a hand. I know, I'm exaggerating. The fate of the whole underground is resting on us, and I can't lose sight of that just... just for one monster, right? Gaster said nothing. Sans turned to look at him, expression neutral this time. Except... Doc, you gotta realize something. Papyrus is the whole underground to me. He's my brother. He's all I have. So, yeah, all the work we're doing, I'm doing it for science and for the good of the underground, and as far as I'm concerned, that means I'm doing it for him. The room was silent for a few moments. Gaster considered Sans thoughtfully. Well said, Sans, Dr. Beatus said, bobbing his head in agreement. I think everyone in the lab has someone like that. Alphys is the world to me. Since my wife, well, Alphys is all I have left, too. Whenever I'm stuck on something and feel like giving up, I just remind myself that I want my daughter to see the sky someday. Sans grinned at him. Yeah. Gaster remained silent. Everyone has someone like that. But Gaster did not. A very, very long time ago, he would have said that it was for his family, but they were gone. Sure, there were a few people he cared strongly for. Asgore, Toriel, Sans, Dr. Beatus. It wasn't enough. None of them were the reason for why he worked so hard. They were people. People died. If a person was your motivation for something, then what happened when that person died, as they always did? He thought of Sans, Dr. Beatus, his entire staff rendered utterly useless by the deaths of their loved ones. Their attachments made them vulnerable. But perhaps that was Gaster's constant distance from people that made him believe that. Or perhaps it was the thought that had been slipping its way into his mind lately. If he did successfully reset this timeline, then everything here, everything from the last several thousand years, would be erased. Not a single thing here, not a single monster, would matter anymore. They would all be gone. Forever. That had been the goal all along, since the moment he had seen that last speck of sunlight wink out. But Gaster hadn't fully realized what that meant. 
until now. Gaster looked at his friends. I suppose it is good to have such a strong reason to keep moving forward, regardless of setbacks. He made himself say. And it's pretty amazing of you to want to protect your brother, Sans, Dr. Beatus chirped. Papyrus can protect himself, but now I can help him out. Heh. <laughs> He can get in over his head sometimes. Still, I know none of my siblings would go through all that for me, Dr. Beatus went on. I've been worried, Sans, but you've been doing amazing so far. What you went through was horrible, so I was sure that... No, wait, stop. Sans head whipped around to check Papyrus's door again. He... he doesn't know about that part. What? You haven't told him? Shh, keep it down. Sans balled a hand in his sweater over his chest. He knows I can use magic now, but he thinks I just took a pill or something. <laughs> you should have seen him when I showed him what I could do. He, he was so happy. Sans clutched his sweater tighter. He can't know about the other part, about what it was like. You guys can't tell him about that, all right? He'd... he'd never forgive me. And honestly, I'd just prefer to forget all about it. The experiment's over. My magic is stable and I'm doing fine. We've got a lot of work to do. You both might as well stop worrying so much about me, so we can move on to other projects. Gaster and Dr. Beatus exchanged a glance, both of them silent. Sans settled down with a tired sigh and let go of his sweater. Sorry, he said, rubbing at his forehead. I'm just sick of thinking about it. Interesting, Gaster thought, then frowned, wondering why he had thought that. No, I'm sorry, Dr. Beatus said contritely. Don't worry, we won't tell your brother. Heck, I'm fine never bringing it up again. Perhaps we have been a bit overbearing of late. Sans chuckled. There, Sans was laughing again. That was much better. Yeah, only a bit, he said, winking at Gaster. It's cool, though. Been nice having you guys over. We never get to just hang out. Tomorrow we will put all this behind us and return to our work concerning the time machine. How does that sound? Sans grinned. Sounds sans-tastic, Doc. Another human had fallen into the underground. It was the same as the last two. They had entered from somewhere near Snowden, or perhaps the border of Snowden and Waterfall. A monster in Snowden had spotted what they swore was a human, and after that the human had vanished as if into thin air. A day later, someone found human footprints and monster dust at the edge of Waterfall. The discovery had a ripple effect through the underground. The last time a monster had died at the hands of a human, it had been a guard in a direct confrontation. This time, the human had simply killed a monster and moved on, disappearing into the network of narrow caves and rivers of Waterfall. They were out there, somewhere and no one knew what their intentions were, or when the human would take another life. Waterfall was tense. Monsters hid in their homes, and the Royal Guard patrolled the caves nonstop. The mood at the lab was heavy. No one spoke much. Those who lived in or had family in Waterfall were constantly stepping out to make calls. Some of the staff hadn't even shown up for work. One of those was Sans. Gaster sat in his office, fidgeting, unable to focus. Sans almost always came in to work late, but it had been about two hours now. Gaster tried very hard not to think about what that could mean. It wasn't like Sans could have been spooked into staying home. There wasn't very much that Sans was afraid of, it seemed. At about three hours, Gaster finally got a call. Sans. He couldn't keep the utter relief from his voice. Hey, Doc. Sorry, I meant to call way sooner. Reception's kinda spotty out here. Heh. <laughs> they really need to build more towers. Sans. Gaster felt vaguely like throwing his phone across the room. He pinched the bridge of his nose. 
Where in the underground are you? I'm, uh, in Waterfall. Gaster felt his determination spike. A few hand-shaped bullets crashed into his desk before he got it under control. I beg your pardon? It's actually a pretty funny story, Sans said thinly. Uh, Papyrus, you know how he is, heard there was a human and just, <laughs> decided to go running out to catch it before, you know, hearing the part about how it killed somebody. Yeah, heh, <laughs> funny. The oversized bonehead is going to bed without a bedtime story tonight, I'll tell you that much. Boy, do I wish I could still just ground him. Gaster drummed his fingers on his desk, ignoring the new crack in the wood. That moronic brother was going to be the death of Sans one of these days. And maybe Gaster as well. Is he safe? I'm working on finding him. Don't worry, I know exactly where he'll be. He set up this trap a while ago in one area. I'm pretty close already. Uh, once I've sent him home, I'll come into the lab. I'll even stay late. I'll get a skeleton of work done. Don't worry about... Oh, holy crap, there he is. Hold on. Sans voice faded, but he didn't hang up. Hey, bro, what the heck you think you're doing out here? Sans, you're too early, brother. I've not yet captured the human. Yeah, sorry, buddy, but you're not capturing any humans today. You're not capturing anything but a whole lot of chores over this stunt. Gaster heard Papyrus screaming protests in the distance. He rubbed his temples. Sans' voice faded back in as he tried to talk over his brother. God, teenagers, right? Sorry, Doc, I'll call you back. He hung up. Gaster set the phone down with an exasperated groan. He didn't understand how Sans could be so patient with Papyrus. The more Gaster was forced to interact with San's brother, the less Gaster could tolerate him. He couldn't imagine a more annoying family member. A few minutes passed. Gaster was thinking that he could just get back to work and wait for San's to come in when his phone rang again. Hey, Doc. Sorry about all this. I sent him home. Now I just need to catch the ferry. But now there's a herd of Temmies between me and the waterway, though, so I'm taking a shortcut. I swear those guys can teleport, but never when it's convenient. That, at least, was understandable. A group of Temmies was about as impassable as the barrier itself. Just get here as soon as possible. Teleportation. Hmm. There was an idea. And do watch your back. Sure, sure. How are things at the lab? Is the guard keeping us up to date? Naturally, though there is little to report. Everyone in Waterfall is giving a convincing story. The last report said the human had been spotted near the wishing room. Though, of course, someone else saw it at the marsh, and someone else said the human had materialized in their kitchen. <laughs> People have some crazy superstitions about those guys. <sighs> Quite. To think that at one point I thought that prophecy nonsense was as bad as it would get. Gaster paused, tapping his fingers on the desk again. Since I have you on the phone, I suppose I should at least put your mind to work. I know you so very much regret having to come to work so very late. It would be remiss of me to not utilize an hour or two of unpaid labor. Jeez, Doc, such a slave driver. You're working me to the bone. Gaster pulled out one of his notebooks, flipping to the pages where he had recorded his original findings from the Orange Soul. Our current situation has gotten me thinking. During the war, one thing we could never understand was why a human who had already killed a monster was so much stronger than a human who had never killed before. A human's strength would increase exponentially the more they killed. The thought that they would increase their own power by simply killing a few monsters drove them, drove some of them, quite bloodthirsty. The seven wizards who cast their barrier spell would have had to slaughter countless monsters to gain the ability to use magic. Sans was quiet on the other end of the phone. No one ever talked about the war, especially not people who had been around to see it, and especially not Gaster. Gaster didn't have time to feel uncomfortable about the memories coming to him after centuries of dormancy. He was too busy thinking. It must have been horrible. It stands to reason that such an increase in power would have to be measurable. Gaster continued, ignoring the comment. 
There was always an unusual energy signature with an orange soul, though it was barely detectable. The same energy was not persistent in the cyan soul, but no two souls are alike. At the time, I thought nothing of it. But now I think the energy reading must have been due to the fact that that human succeeded in killing a monster. Your thoughts? Sans made a few thoughtful noises. I remember those readings. It makes sense, I guess. But how does the level increase? You think they're absorbing monster souls? Gaster shook his head, though Sans, of course, couldn't see him. No, that is impossible for humans, no matter how strong. For some reason, they can't absorb souls at all. Energy can't be created or destroyed, so it must be coming from somewhere, yeah? So maybe your regular human, like, say, the light blue kid... Cyan. Eh, same thing. So the cyan kid is at, like, sort of a baseline. No murdering, no increase in energy level. But orange kid, well, she kills a poor guard. So she gains something. Something that increases the energy. Or, eh, more like she gains the energy itself. And if she had killed more, then the energy would have increased. Interesting. So your theory is that the energy is not present in the average human soul. Can't say I've met enough humans to have an average. Maybe the light blue kid was the one who was unique. I have an idea for some tests to run once I get in. Should be fun. Assuming you can get yourself in here before everyone goes home. Heh. <laughs> Don't challenge me, Doc. Hey, hold on just a sec. Gaster blinked. What is it? Perhaps his brother had returned to yell some more. Hold on, something's making noise. I think a Temi got separated from the rest of the vibrating hordes. Let me just... Gaster sighed and waited. And waited. There were some indistinct noises on the other side of the phone. Then a muffled word that Gaster couldn't make out. He frowned. Sans? No answer. Sans! Doc. Sans' voice had dropped to a whisper. Uh, Sans, what's going on? Is the Timmy trying to buy something off you? Really? Doc, I... I think I found the human. If Sans had a heart, it would likely be pounding. He was hiding behind a small ledge in one of the narrower caves. Beyond the ledge, the cave opened up a bit to allow some patchy areas of tall grass. The other end of the cave was blocked by one of Waterfall's many creeks. The human was standing at the edge of the water, picking grass and seeds out of their clothes. They were unmistakably a human. Sans had never seen the human with the orange soul, so he only had the other specimen to compare to this one. But he had read somewhere that humans were relatively uniform in appearance. The similarities to the little girl with the light blue soul were uncanny. The skin was a bit darker, the hair a bit longer, the clothes obviously different. This one wore some kind of a frilly thing around their waist. The shoes were odd. Overall, the human was skeleton-shaped, if you could imagine a skeleton with flesh. Sans peeked out from behind the ledge, chancing another look. There was a large patch of grass between him and the human, but he could just barely make them out between the blades. They hadn't seen him yet. He ducked back behind the ledge, keeping his phone's speaker covered. Gaster was saying something, but his voice was thankfully muffled by Sans carpels. Hopefully the human wouldn't hear anything over the sound of the water. A live human. A real live human right in the middle of Waterfall, and Sans was the one to find it. He couldn't believe his bad luck. He had to stay calm. He was good at staying calm. But he had also never been less than 20 yards away from a live human. Sans breathed as quietly as he could and lifted the phone again. Sans? Answer me! Sans! Shh. I'm here. Oh, thank goodness. What's going on? What is happening? Sans sank to a crouch and shifted so he could peer out from behind the ledge. The human was just standing there. It's definitely the human, he whispered, clutching the phone tighter. It's in one of the caves near the main waterway. Damn, 
I don't think they saw me. I'm hiding behind a ledge. Gaster said something and Sands frowned, unable to translate. It was easy to understand Gaster in person, but it became difficult over the phone or through a computer. It was worse when the doctor became frantic or emotional, which was rare. There was something visual about the way Gaster spoke that tended to get lost when you had nothing but sound. Sorry, Doc, can you say that again? I asked if you knew exactly where in Waterfall you are. Gaster said, his voice level again. If it's near the waterway, then it's near quite a few monster settlements. A shudder went through Sands. For now, there were no other monsters around, but there was always a Temi or a Washua passing through this area. Shiren's pond wasn't far away. Anyone could show up at any time. Sands couldn't see a weapon, but maybe this human didn't even need one. I'm two caves west of Shiren's Pond and three north of the waterway. Sands was sweating. Do you think you can contact the guards and have someone come here? The human moved. Sands flinched and ducked lower into the grass, careful not to make a sound. The human sat down on the mossy ground and sighed loud enough for Sands to hear. At this angle, he could see the human a little better. It occurred to him that the human was... Small. Not as small as the little girl had been, but not very much bigger, either. They wouldn't be much shorter than Sans. Another kid? What? Sorry, I missed that. I said I will see what I can do. Stay on the line. Y yeah Sans set the phone on the ground beside him. If the human suddenly spotted him, he would need both hands free. Who knew how long it would take for the guards to get here? In the meantime, he just had to keep his eye sockets on the kid, the human. The human covered its stomach with a hand. I'm so hungry. The human's voice startled San so much he almost fell backward. Why didn't I save any of that pie? I should have saved some. So dumb. They sniffed and rubbed at their face. Was the human crying? Sands frowned, watching the human dig into a pocket. They pulled out an ancient-looking cell phone and hunched over it to dial a number. Where in the world had this human gotten a cell phone? Did humans have cell phones? Did some monster give it to them? Did they steal it off some poor monster's dust? The human raised the phone to their ear, still sniffling. Sands leaned forward a little, curious. After several long seconds, though, the human lowered it once more. They clutched it with both hands, staring at it. They looked lost. How come you never pick up? The human sniffled. Why'd you give me a cell phone if you weren't gonna answer? Miss, I want to talk to you so bad. It's just like you said it would be. It's so scary out here. They're all so scary. These monsters keep attacking me. I don't know what to do. The kid was openly crying now. Sans could see the tears streaming down their face. He watched as the kid dialed a number again and raised the phone back to their ear. Pick up, please. Miss, please, I need you. Please, please pick up. Miss, I'm so scared. You're the only nice one. Pick up, pick up. No one answered. The kid let out a sob and dropped the phone. They drew their knees up to their chest and buried their head in their arms. Sands watched the kid shake with quiet sobs. There was a muffled sound from his own phone. He picked it up. Yeah, I'm... I'm still here. Good. Any change? Has the human moved? We're... Still in the same spot, they, uh, sat down and tried to call someone on a phone. Now they're just... crying. Uh, I see. Sans, the Royal Guard is sending someone to your location, but they don't know when they'll get there. The Guard is spread thin throughout Waterfall. Poor tactics, really. This is bad. The longer you are there, the more likely the human is to notice your presence. And we cannot afford to let that human disappear again. 
What's more, if they reach the waterway, it's such a heavily trafficked area. So many monsters, so many potential victims. We cannot allow the human to reach the waterway. Sans frowned, watching the kid. They hadn't moved. They were just sitting there, sobbing helplessly. Like any monster kid who had gotten lost far from home would. So what should we do? There was a long silence. Sans heard nothing but the sound of insects in the grass and the child's crying. After a minute or two, Gaster finally spoke. Kill it. Sans felt his eye lights go out. What? He must have heard wrong. He must have. Kill it, Sans. You're right there. If you move quickly, you can end it before the human has time to react. Do you have a spare soul container on you? I... yes, but... Excellent. Good foresight, Sans. Now do it quickly. The first chance you have. Sans' hands started to shake. He felt his non-existent insides twist. Doc? He managed to keep his voice level. That's not a very funny joke. I am most certainly not joking, Sans. Don't be absurd. A breath caught between Sans' ribs, almost making him choke. He stared through the grass at the child, still on the ground. Doc, I can't. Of course you can. You have plenty of bullets now at your disposal. Sans lowered the phone and hissed through his teeth, covering his eye sockets with his free hand. That wasn't the point. Gaster was his friend and colleague, but the doctor could be so blind to such simple things. No, Doc, I mean... I mean, I... can't. His voice shook. He took a breath to get it back under control. I've never killed anything before. I'm not a fighter. I mean, what the hell, Doc? You can't just... you can't just ask me to murder someone. It's not murder, Sans. It's self-defense. A preemptive strike. That human will kill other monsters. Or you if you don't act. Listen... I understand how you must feel, but- It's a kid, Doc. Sans' voice dropped to the barest of whispers. They're just a kid. They're- they're a scared, lost kid. What if they didn't even mean to kill that monster before? He heard Gaster sigh over the phone. There was a silence. He had to know that Sans couldn't do something like this. Gaster had been strange lately, but it wasn't like he was heartless. Sans could just keep an eye on the kid and intervene if anything happened. Sooner or later, a guard would arrive. And then... And then the guard would kill the kid. Or maybe the kid would kill the guard. They would send more guards. And then, sooner or later, the kid would die. That... that was fine. This had always been the plan. Gather souls. Study them use soul power to break the barrier and escape the underground. The hope was always that they would discover something about human souls that would allow them to break the barrier without needing the full seven. That was the whole point of the save and reset research. Monsters couldn't escape the underground without human souls. One, three, seven. Sans wasn't stupid. This was the reality. But they were just a kid. Sans, whether they meant to kill a monster or not does not change the fact that it happened. A scared young man is just as dangerous as an angry adult. We were just discussing the energy levels of a human who had taken a monster life, were we not? They will be feeling the energy even now. They will wonder what it is like to increase that energy. They will become drunk on it. Sans, you need to kill the human before it happens. Do you want the deaths of other monsters on your conscience? Sans had to stop himself from yelling. He gripped his teeth hard enough that they creaked. The human was still sitting there. Their sobs had quieted a bit and they were wiping their face on their sleeve. They didn't look like a killer. They didn't look bloodthirsty. They just looked sad and alone. I don't want the death of a kid on my conscience either. I told you quite a while ago that our work would take us down some unsavory paths. I didn't think that included murder. The human lifted their head and turned. 
Sands froze. The human looked directly at the patch of grass in which he was hiding. Huh. Hello? The human said in a small voice. Is someone there? Sands covered his mouth with one hand and the phone with the other, willing himself to stay silent. He could faintly hear Gaster's voice through the phone. For several long seconds, Sands didn't even breathe. The human scooted back a few inches from the grass, still watching it with wide eyes. If they shifted their angle just slightly, they would be able to see Sands through the blades. And then... And then... Finally, after an eternity, the human turned away. They sighed shakily and rested their forehead on their knees. Sands breathed again. He shifted his way backward through the grass, not even making the tiniest sound. He moved back behind the rock ledge, then collapsed against it, shaking. Gaster was all but yelling through the phone. Sands lifted it back to the side of his head. Sands? Sands, answer me. What's happening? Sands! Still here. Oh, oh, thank God. Sands, please, please don't scare me like that. Sands tilted his head back until he was resting it against the stone. The ceiling of the cave was lost in darkness. There weren't even any of the glittering stones here. Just black. Doc, I... He stopped, sighed, began again. Can't I just tail the human? Wait for the guard? I can't... I can't do this. Gaster was quiet for a moment. I can't afford to lose you, Sans. You are my friend, and the best scientist I have. What would I be if you had died at the hand of a human? Gaster paused again. I'm running out of time. I need you to outlive me, Sans. I need you to continue my work when I'm gone. Sans almost threw the phone. He hated that line. He hated it. Gaster had always been manipulative. Sans had known that since day one, and most of the time he was willing to just go along with it. But that line was the worst. Gaster only used it when he was out of other options, and he had been using it more and more often lately. It was such a terrible thing to say to someone, and Sans couldn't even be sure that it was true. Doc. He couldn't keep the tremor out of his voice now. Gaster, please. I know it's not pleasant, Sans, but you need to do this. More monsters will die if you don't act. They're just a kid. And then suddenly, without warning, Gaster's voice turned harsh. I gave you power, Sans. You're not allowed to be weak anymore. Something in Sans went cold. He raised a hand to his chest. His fingers curled into his sweater. Gaster kept going. You need to do this, Sans. Now, you'll be protecting the whole underground. All of this. Think of your brother. What if he is still in Waterfall? Sans hadn't known. He hadn't known that Gaster could be so cruel. On the other side of the ledge, Sans heard the human get to their feet. He peeked around the edge. They were on the move, heading for the opposite side of the cave, toward the waterway, toward the rest of the underground. Sans, are you still there? Sans? Sans, listen to me. You look at it, and you see a child. But you can't think of it that way. It's dangerous, Sans. You don't understand how. Listen to me. I've seen humans, human children, cut down monsters thrice their size. I've seen a single child slaughter whole villages. You can't understand what it's like. Sans stepped out from behind the ledge. The human was walking slowly, but soon they would reach the exit. Sans, answer me! Sans! Sans dropped the phone and moved. He pushed his way through the grass. The human let out a terrified squeak at the sound and whirled. Who's there? Who's there? Sans called on his magic. It was so easy these days. No effort. No pain. All thanks to the good doctor. He was quick. It was over before the kid even spotted him. 
Sans stood back, watching a red liquid spread from the human. He covered his face with one hand. I'm sorry. 